morning and happy Friday. Welcome to the ICAT Play Date. My name is Phyllis Newbill. I am the Associate Director of Educational Networks in one of ICAT's several centers. I'm so glad to see all your faces this morning. A few housekeeping things before we get started. Um, we are videoing today, so your questions will exist on the internet following the event, so just behave accordingly. Um, also, if you're watching online this morning, good morning. I'm so glad you're here. Please hit that like and subscribe. Um, if you're in the room, I hope that you'll sign in on our clipboard. I'll pass that around again. Um, our clipboard helps us, one, know who's here, and also helps us justify donuts and coffee, which may be the most important thing. So make sure you get that. And also make sure you're enjoying the donuts and coffee because they are here for your enjoyment. When you have questions today, just wait for me to get to you with the microphone. Uh, so that the folks online will be able to hear you. If you're online, if you'll use that questions link on the ICAT homepage, um, we will get your questions. If Professional Development Network is helpful to you as a Virginia Tech faculty member, make sure that you sign up for today's um, play date. You can get credit for that. You need to sign up first, and then you need to check in. There's a two-step process there. Um, so sign up, and then just make eye contact with me, and I will give you your 100% for your presence today. Um, announcements this week. Um, coming up next weekend, so not tomorrow, but Saturday, November 11th, I hope you'll all be at the Virginia Tech Science Festival. That is in the Moss Art Center, on the Torg Bridge, on Alumni Mall, and in Newman Library. We have almost 60 different exhibits of fun things that folks can do related to science and the arts and research at Virginia Tech. We hope that you'll come bring all your friends. If you love that kind of thing very much, or even if you don't, I don't actually care, um, you can volunteer to help at the Science Festival. There are lots of vo volunteer opportunities available. If that is of interest to you, uh, please let me know. I've got, a, I've got a great link that will make it super easy for you uh, that we can forward to you. All right, this morning, we're talking about games. Game design and game studies, again, uh, yeah, I'm not ever supposed to have favorites, but this is another of my super favorite uh, topics that we, we work with at ICAT. I'm going to turn it straight over, who is speaking first? Zach is speaking first, so I'm going to let Zach introduce the team, and um, we'll just welcome you. Glad you're here. Let's, hello. Tianyu, you promised me this would work. Where are you, Tianyu? Ah, there we go. Okay. Do you guys want to come up? So we can all stand up here together. Thanks. Hi, good morning. My name is Zach Dewar. I am a professor in the School of Visual Arts. And we're going to talk to you a little bit today about a curriculum project that we've been working on um, for trying to figure out how to make game design and game studies function as curriculum here as an interdisciplinary topic. Um, we also have Sang here, and Jimmy, and Michael, who come from computer science, and from English, and from electrical and computer engineering. Um, and there's a number of other people on the grant project as well who are not here today, and you can see their names up here. All right, I'm going to start us off, and then we'll all talk a little bit about what we're doing. So we're working on a larger curriculum. We're working on something like a minor, for example, is what we have our eyes set on right now. But this semester, we are piloting the first class in that minor, which is called Introduction to Game Design and Game Studies. And uh, if you were at the Pecha Kucha earlier this semester, I apologize, there's going to be a little bit of repetition here. Um, we are doing this over in the media building. And we have students from, well, it's being hosted by University Honors, because it's one of the fastest ways for us to do interdisciplinary curriculum to try to teach in a very sort of unique way without having to think about the way that it's structured within the university, just to try something out as a pilot for the first time. So here's an image of uh, some of the students in the classroom working on a game prototype, a really fast game prototype with tabletop materials, cards, paper, pencils, stuff like this. So we're teaching five modules. There's five professors from five different areas teaching five different subject matters, all relating to game design and game studies. They're non-sequential, which means we could teach them in any order. And eventually the idea is, instead of all of us teaching in one classroom, which is what we're doing right now, if you can imagine how intimidating that is for students to have five faculty looking at them all the time instead of just one, uh, the idea is eventually we would actually have five different sections 
and the students would rotate between, or the faculty would rotate between, however you want to look at it, right? Uh, and the first section this semester was taught by Michael, and so do you want to talk a little bit about what you're doing? Okay. Um, so um, I'm covering the module on game logic and game prototyping. So what, what we're using is the in-house, we built this tool in electrical and computer engineering called Game Engineer, in which the users, in this case, the students, will describe their game, their game's logic in English, as you can see there. There is one rabbit, there is one spin star, et cetera, et cetera. So you describe the game in English, and then the system automatically converts it to the game in which they can play, they can test, they can optimize, they can change, they can share. Um, so this allows them to do fast prototyping, and the system has AI in it, so it also gives them feedback, real-time feedback, and guidance as to how to do certain things. So suppose you want to describe something that's not very clear, the system identifies that ambiguity, that incorrect description, and gives you suggestions on how to correct, correctly describe that. And in addition, there are hundreds of sample games designed by ECE undergraduate students using this platform, and they're up there that people can use to discover and learn logic behind many of the popular games. Yeah. And I need you to play this video. So here you can see a little bit of what the students experience. When a fox sees the rabbit it chases it. Programmatically unclear, for the second pronoun it, it is interpreted as rabbit. For sentences containing multiple objects, you should have only one pronoun to reduce ambiguity and enhance clarity. Example, when a fox sees the rabbit, it chases the rabbit. Okay, so on the, uh, these are some of the, so we'll have uh, 18 students in, in the, this semester's class. So from the module, they have an assignment to design games. And so here are a few games designed by the students in the class, like Donkey Kong. Uh, these are Donkey Kong with a twist. And these are color matching games. And there's a uh, platformer uh, game on the right. But uh, some, of, some of the games that the students did design were really, really interesting. And, 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 uh, this is a free website, you can go on and, and check out their games. All right, so uh, I taught the next module, which is about um, sort of what are games, what are the elements of games, and how do we think about game design. So sort of walking them through some of the literature on how to think about games. I mean, I think a lot of students naturally, there's a lot of people in uh, my age and younger, basically, where games were a fundamental part of their lives growing up and through all their lives. And it's becoming more true for uh, more segments of the population. But there's always, you know, well, that's not a game. You're not playing a game. You're just playing words with friends on your phone, right? And so trying to help them have language to talk about uh, what are games? What are, what are their properties? And how can we think about them? Um, so 
I thought this was kind of funny. Just looking through, you know, first of all, some of the really common literature thinking about um, what are the parts of games. And I wasn't happy with any of them, so I made the one on the bottom left, which is less simple, but I think more accurate. I'm working on making it look nicer. <laughs> um, and uh, talking about game loops, thinking about uh, when you come into a game, how do you encounter the information that's in a game? And how do you learn from it? So you see a problem in a game, and how do you figure out how to overcome it, right? You come in with a mental model of something, you come in with an idea of how something's going to work. You see a door, for example, and you have a mental model of how doors work, right? But a door in a video game is not a door in real life. It's a simulated door, and they've chosen to represent it in a particular way. Does it have a handle? Does the handle work? How do you interact with it? Do you press E? How do you know this information, right? So you start with a mental model, you try an action, and you get feedback on that action. That updates your mental model, and then you try again until you can overcome the problem, right? This is a fundamental part of how games work. And uh, learning these sort of basic things so they can apply this framework to designing their own games. And then lastly, talking a little bit, I was really proud of making this, by the way. Um, talking a little bit about uh, what motivates different kinds of people to play games. So you can think about, you know, I like games that are really fast and have lots of action, and I want to, you know, you know, make sure all my enemies, you know, die in their awful little graves or something like that, right? Some people might feel that way, and some people just want to play Words with Friends with their mom on their phone, right? And they're not, neither of them are wrong, but what motivates those different kinds of players? Thinking about that, and then thinking about how some of those motivations and the rewards can be exploited, by games today that are primarily interested in um, exploiting those motivations to make a quick buck, basically, right? And how we can um, recognize those in games and do better. Uh, the next module was taught by Jimmy. You gonna do this thing? Yeah. Zach said there's the five faculty always looking at and that's not really true because I skip class a lot when I'm not teaching and I'm sorry. But um, so this is actually the same order as teaching the class. So it's a very similar experience. You get all that interesting stuff and then you get to talk about research papers, right? right. Yeah? Okay. So this isn't really the most exciting part, but the, the goal is hopefully I've been doing social behavioral research with games for a long time. If you see me, I'm always talking about the same stuff. Um, uh, the goal is that they can, you know, apply the state of that research to their own design, hopefully, or their other work that they might have in or adjacent to the industry. Some of it being, you know, being aware of the state of things that maybe they don't have to worry about so much, and some of maybe that they do. We started talking a little bit about some things not to have to worry about so much. Don't worry too much about these pictures, but, um, you know, like, for example, some overstated problems like uniform effects of things like violence on crime. Some things that are very much in debate, like concerns about like addiction or overuse and well-being. Like we got all those little downward curves that show that like generally well-being doesn't fall off till you use games a lot. And just kind of the state of the research being, it's not exactly a lot of like solved problems that we know the answer to for sure. You can go ahead, Zach. And then getting into the fact that the, the debate, the research climate itself is less than resolved and kind of less than healthy in a lot of ways I think is useful to know as a member of the public in general or as a parent or as a player, but also as a designer so you don't see one, you know, TED talk or one headline and just assume it's a go, which is never a good idea with behavioral research, I think. And then get back into like a little bit the same as Zach, but from a much more boring way, kind of how we tend to think about games a lot, which I think historically in social behavioral research has been just kind of as a uniform stimulus because it's easy to design research around that. And then maybe how to think about games differently in terms of social dimensions of them. And again, at the end of the day for a designer or somebody interested in the implications of game design for the humans using them, the state of that research. And then kind of lastly, things maybe after I spend a lot of time telling them not to worry about stuff that people tell them to worry about, things that maybe we should worry about like representation issues, which I think designers are part of that problem and can be part of that solution or um, general like online behavior issues where maybe the worst thing and best thing about games is their users and uh, some of the same problems that we see in real life like gendered behavior and things like that 
and how we can kind of design around that if we're not talking about the same old problems over and over. So the goal is to try to give a little overview of the state of the research and especially maybe what they should be worrying about doing right in their design from it and what they should take away. And then after that, they get a lot happier when they talk to Sang, who has more interesting stuff to tell you about. All right, so, so what I'm teaching in the, in the course is about UI and UX, and then game is always an interesting topic for me. So if you think from a traditional HCI context, right, like, you know, when you design a rice cooker, like, you know, it has to cook the rice, right? And then you design a door handle, like, you know, like, a user has to be effectively, efficiently open the door or close the door, right? So if you apply the same kind of principle to game, it doesn't work, right? So Let's say if you want, like, you know, and you, when we think of usability, we talk about efficiency, effectiveness, and satisfaction. And then, like, so let's say you can, as a game designer, you can, you can design a weapon that can kill all the enemies all at once. Like, right, you have a choice of that that's very efficient uh, from HCI perspective, but it's, like, probably useless as a game, right? So we, in the lower level, uh, UI needs to be effective and efficient, but in the overall, in the higher level, UX needs to be, has to, involve something beyond like traditional notion of usability. So I teach four different things like, you know, UI components like that are commonly observed in game and then how we, I mean, this particular uh, slide is how can you help user learn game mechanics effectively. So um, if it's, I mean, there's like a very subtle, um, you know, uh, balance that you have to have. Like, you know, if it's too easy, it's gonna be boring. It's gonna be, if it's too difficult, it's gonna be um, frustrating, so where, this, where do we find the balance and then what are the components, UI components that are uh, needed to accomplish the process. Also, uh, we I also teach like the UX research, uh, game research, so how can we design a good game and then it's not just like, you know, coding and programming and building a nice looking avatar, but also getting feedback from users and observing and then uh, uh, an iterating process that's involved in uh, creating good games, so that's another thing that I teach. The last part that I teach is like what else, like other than other than game, how can game could be useful? So I talk about uh, gamifi gamification and game as an artistic medium or um, you know a musical medium. So that the game, how games could be a, a platform for for uh, non-game applications. So those are the um, stuff that I teach in UA UX modules. And Avery can't be here today. Avery is in English, but uh, he's teaching the last module. And since he's not here, we're going to be very brief. Haha. <laughs> uh, so he's talking about how stories and gameplay inter interrelate with each other. Um, what does it mean to have an interactive story? How does that shape the way stories work? Um, and this has been a long debate going back 40 years, right? So more than that, this is a really great image. It was made by uh, Ian Bogost, who's um, one of the uh, sort of uh, um, big academic video game critics and philosophers. Uh, and he, Avery, starts teaching on Monday. So it'll be interesting Tuesday? Tuesday, I can remember, anyway, um, to see what he's gonna cover. So we each taught about five classes, we each had a little assignment, and then the students are working collaboratively to sort of address a research question or a sort of design-led um, project for the final part of the, the um, semester. And uh, as you've seen, I think what we're enjoying about this class is that games are really a fundamentally interdisciplinary endeavor, as are, as are many things. But I don't think there's a way for us to really talk fairly about games without having all of these perspectives plus more in the room at the same time. Um, what we're not doing is a game development curriculum. I don't think that we have I don't know that it makes sense for us to, to start there. I think this is a good place for us to start working um, where we're thinking about how we talk about games, how we design games. And so we've done the obligatory pathways. Um, we're going down that, that path uh, right now of trying to get this course moved through governance. And it's been an interesting process because what we're doing right now is that one of us is teaching a course and the other four of us are just showing up which you're not supposed to do. In fact, when the registrar found out when they, we were just like showing up, they're like, you need to get credit. And I'm like, my, my director doesn't even know I'm here. They have no idea. Um, so trying to figure out how do we get a commitment 
from like four different colleges and like six different departments to not just give faculty time, but to say, hey, you know, if Zach decides to keel over or, you know, go take a job somewhere else, whichever comes first, um, how do we replace him? Because the School of Visual Art sees Zach as filling one role for the School of Visual Art, but might not prioritize this curriculum, right? How do we make that work across all these different parts of the university? So we're working with the Academy of Transdisciplinary Studies, which is funny because it's in CLAWS. The Transdisciplinary Studies Academy is inside a college, which I'm still trying to wrap my head around. But Carlos Sevilla is fantastic, and we're trying to figure out how to take a larger program, like a minor, and not just design it as curriculum, but to actually think about sustainability for an interdisciplinary curriculum for like 10 years. How would this actually happen? How does the money work? That's a big question. So uh, let's see. I think that's all we have wanted to talk about today. So thank you all for being here. And if we have any questions, be happy to answer them. I think all of us would. If you want anyone in particular to answer a question, please let us know. Phyllis, did you want to say anything? I just want to. I just want to. I just want to say thank you. Wonderful. We do have time for questions, so who's, who's got one? All right, then head your way. Um, I, I'd like to start off by saying uh, I have not like shut up this entire presentation because I am so excited for a course like this to actually exist. Uh, it's pretty much everything that I've always wanted to pursue myself, but um, the question I have is, uh, especially with regard to taking a more formal route, more uh, like interdisciplinary, focusing on many different sort of sections, and bring them all together in a very concise sort of fashion so that people who are interested in the design of games and not necessarily just the development is. Um, I was wondering how you see this fitting into the current uh, sort of uh, environment of indie games that are come out a lot of like single developers who are developing things mostly just uh, off the cuff, like just going by what they feel is right and how you think that courses like these will kind of affect that scene. Do you guys want to answer that? Do you want me to answer that? Does anyone have something they want to say? All right. So, uh, you know, it's interesting. The very first slide that was in the background, just the very introduction, is a game called Braid from 2007, which was one of the very first games that actually got traction as an independent game made by essentially one person. Uh, and, like, you know, nothing is really truly made just by just one person, right? Um, but having said that, with that happened at the same time, right, of course, is Steam coming to the fore and having a publishing um, distribution network and also being able to have broadband connections that were fast enough to download games, like all that kind of happened at the same time, right? And so what you're describing, I, I don't necessarily think is, is new, right? It's been around for about 15 years-ish. Um, and the issues that a lot of independent game developers face now is that there is so much noise, right? So it's um, usually a phenomenon referred to as the long tail, right? So a lot of people play very few games, and then it kind of goes down, like double A, where a medium amount of people play a few games, right? But then there's all these games that a very few number of people play, right? Um, and how a curriculum like this can help people, I think that what we're trying to do is whether you're in computer science or psychology or English, this is something that's interesting to a lot of our students. And maybe it's just about being able to see what's in their culture and be critical of it and reflect on it. And that's great. That's really, really important. But if you want to take this and you want to take the next step, and for someone like me, and I think for a lot of us, part of understanding and learning things is also through practice, right? And so having a chance to do rapid prototyping how do I understand basic game logic? How do I take game design ideas and do them on paper and card games really quickly um, so that I can iterate and then if I want to, I can take those um, skills and bring them into a development space where I kind of understand a little bit of, like from a, from a curriculum like this, I understand how to think about a structure of a game um, so that I can design it more effectively and think about it more effectively. Does that answer your question?
Uh, thank you. Um, of course, Zach, you know this is right up my alley, so I'm really interested in this. I wonder if you could speak a little bit more about the students in the class. Are there prereqs? How do you um, deal with the fact that you might have computer science majors who already have, are adept in certain things, or people in sociology or psychology or visual arts who are bringing ex you know, their own expertise? Um, how are you sort of meeting in the middle, and are you leveraging those areas of expertise within students? Michael, do you want to? You could might speak well to that one, yeah. Yeah, so um, we have 18 students in the class, and I think four or five are computer science majors, something like that, and then the rest are, you know, just scattered all around. Um, uh, some are uh, humanities majors, some are uh, visual arts, etc. So the thing is, even in my module, uh, because you you describe the game in English, so there's really not the formality of knowing or the requirement of knowing a programming language. So yes, some students already know how to program, some students don't. But this levels the playing ground, so 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 uh, let them design their own games. So so even a person who doesn't know a single line of programming language can still do Donkey Kong. So, so, um, so, so that's not a requirement. And then there are um, parts of the course on, you know, talking about representation of the game. Uh, and, you know, whether it's sexist, what, what, whether it's too male dominated, et cetera. And, and those things can, can engage all disciplines, right? Uh, engineers need to understand problems like that. And humanities majors also need to discuss so, so I think we, we try to cover every space and, and without, without you know, um, biasing the course, overly technical or overly you know, you know, uh, uh, humanities. So hope that answered your question. From an ethical standpoint, and speaking specifically to, to Jimmy's section, um, I guess what role do you all see as educators in um, teaching students to, um, let's say, their approach to games is to not be exploitive, which we've seen happening a lot in the gaming industry? Um, you know, what effect do you think you'd be able to make on people entering into the industry and being able to change that industry so it's less exploitive? as we've seen. And I think Jimmy, you know, his, 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 he talked about that with his daughter. Yeah, I mean, you said you said you all, so I can't speak for everybody, and I think there's, there's I think what all of them do has ethical implications. I think, uh, I think some of what I'm doing is particularly relevant to what, some of what you're talking about in terms of users and design, and I, think, I guess for me, a lot of the goal, at least for this course, and I think a curriculum like this in terms of the research or interpreting existing research part, uh, I think a lot of it is probably to be, provide an accurate picture of what we know and don't know about uh, games and like behavior and effects on users. And again, I don't think that's really well understood even within the research community and it's especially poorly communicated to students and the public, I think. So to me, I think a big ethical part is just like, what do we know and not know, especially like what is a problem and what's not and things like that. Because it's kind of a zero-sum game thing. If something's kind of a small problem, then we need to worry about bigger problems first. And so to me, I think the big ethical thing is like, what do we know and not know about behavior and phenomena in this? So that's my, my kind of perspective on it. They may have different thoughts because it's obviously, you know, it's dripping with ethical things, every element of the design. I think it comes up a little bit throughout, but I think we could also, it's a really good question, we could spend more time um, really purposely having a meta-reflection on the industry, which kind of happens in each module a little bit, right? Um, but to really bring to their the forefront of the students, um, not just being critical and studying the games that we're looking at, but the way that they're made in practice in today's culture, speaking to both of your points, right? Um, I think that would be a great thing to try to figure out, you know, where, how to integrate that more purposefully into the curriculum. Yeah, thank you. Excellent. Well, we are at time, so I want to thank you all again for being here today, um, and I hope that everybody 
also has had a great time. We'll be here again next week with more coffee and more donuts. Next week is from our Center for the Future of Work, part of our uh, another of, of the ICAT Center. So y'all have a great weekend. We'll see you again, and feel free to hang around and keep having donuts and chatting with folks.